Hi everybody, welcome to the 47th edition of How Do You Know? I'm Dr. Daniel Barth. Our friend Scott is at the Carolyn Shoemaker Memorial this weekend. So I'm here with my good friend Kent Martz from Explore Scientific and we're broadcasting from the Explore Studios in Springdale today. I probably should have taken that intro. I don't know why I didn't because I don't do this show and Scott would have done the intro. Well, well, hello, everybody, or whatever he would say. I just didn't. That's okay. And then it came up on the screen, and we were watching it, and it just blew our minds. So, quite anyway. all right. All right, so quite all right. Dr. D, what are we talking about today? So, today we're, uh, we're going to be talking about imaging black holes. And today's show and the next couple weeks' shows are coming out of questions from audience members, not always our audience members. I do a lot of astronomy presentations for clubs and various schools, various organizations, and some of the things that have come up where people have said, ooh, ooh, I have a question. And uh, a lot of times I don't think about these much because when there's current astronomy news, I usually have a pretty good background. It's pretty hard to stump me and come up with something completely novel I haven't heard of and I make a pretty quick decision, wow, that's interesting, I'm going to learn more. Or, no, that's just the media, you know, pre-digesting stuff for the general public. But every once in a while, my audience members come up with something and they say, oh, could you please talk to us more about this? So this week's question and this week's show uh, comes out of a question from a program I did for a West Coast Astronomy Club. I was speaking to them via Zoom. Might as well give them a shout out. The Antelope Valley Astronomy Club, the AVAC, and they're located in Antelope Valley, California, out in the high desert. <clears throat> and uh, they came up with a number of good questions, but this one came up. I was talking to them about galaxy collisions, and somebody said, oh, I heard we, we can see black holes now. I'm like, well, sort of. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. But we just wanted to start with some opening comments. There's always little bits and pieces in the news, which I go, ooh, ooh, shiny. Got to include that because I know our audience likes them. Some of them are like, oh, aren't they? You see them, it's like they make a big deal out of something. It's just like, oh, not again. Well, the media is what it is. Mm -hmm. And you've got to... The more intelligence and background knowledge you bring to the news, the more you'll get out of it, like so many other things. And uh, we're looking at a couple of things that occurred in the news uh, just this last week. One I was very excited about. They found a halite sample, which is basically large crystalline rock salt. Salt can crystallize into crystals up to two, three, four centimeters and more across and this mineral is called halite. And inside the samples, the crystals aren't always solid. Some of you are familiar with geodes, crystalline rocks, and you crack them open, and there's lots of shiny crystals inside. Well, if you actually there when they're cracked open, the interior of that rock has fluid in it. And the fluid was super saturated with minerals. As it got colder, the minerals crystallized out on the inside of this rocky bubble. It's called an inclusion. Gemstones can have inclusions, pockets of gas and liquid that were trapped inside the crystal. And it's no different than a pocket of bubble or liquid inside an ice cube comes out of your fridge. Right. <clears throat> and what they found in these rock samples, they went ahead and dated them. Again, radio dating. They found these were on the order of 830 to 850 million years old, close to a billion years old. Wow, an amazing span of time. The Earth itself about four and a half to five billion years old. Continents and life on Earth about three and a half to four billion years old. These rock salt samples were 850 million or 0.85 billion years old. A sixth, a sixth. A sixth of the Earth's existence. Yes. So Very good way of putting right? it. Very good way of putting it. Yeah. Well, they're looking inside and they see they have these little inclusions, these little pockets of salty water. Water that is basically 
enclosed in the crystal, it's too salty and to freeze or get out, and there's no way for any more salt to crystallize out. So you just got this hollow space inside. They're looking inside with x-rays, and they're going, hmm, wow, I'm seeing organic molecules inside here. And so biomolecules. And people are going, wow, that's neat. Let's do some more tests. And they're looking, and they're realizing these are well-preserved organic solids. That's their term the scientists are using. And they're looking in there and they're saying, you know what? These solids are large enough that they could be cells. And we have taken cells and rehydrated and reanimated them. They were never actually dead. The cellular process is restarted. For things that were up to 50 to 100 million years old, they're now looking at these inclusions and they're saying, you know what? We could have living cells that predate all existing life on Earth now by 800 million years. And astonishing, astonishing stuff. They have not opened these up yet, and I'm sure they're thinking about that, but you don't just take a hammer and crack this open and say, let's crack it open, put it on a Petri dish, and see what we've got. You have to be. You have to make sure you don't contaminate anything. That everything's sterile, and I'm very technical. And we're talking about very small bubbles, it's millimeter like, size. Yeah, it's not yeah. like a head size. No, 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 bubble, no, right? no, no. We're talking no, no. About we're something. talking one to two millimeter bubbles right. inside crystals that are one to two centimeters across. So salt crystals have a unique structure that they're effectively impermeable to anything. Nothing's getting in. No, right. there, it's a. It's a. It's it's as solid a lattice as, as nature yeah. can create, right? Yes, it's a very solid 90-degree lattice. That's why uh, bits of salt, you have famous experiment, you've probably done this, friends. Sprinkle a little salt on a piece of paper, look at it with a microscope or a magnifying glass, and you can see they're all little cubes because the lattice is a 90-degree lattice. But you can get inclusions. You can get areas inside that do not solidify. <coughs> and... They're essentially a time capsule from 800 million years ago, and I'm going to be following this story. You see this more in amber. You, know, you see you it in amber? Spiders and other you know, ancient creatures encased in, in yes, amber. Yes, that's, that's a little different because amber is a liquid. It starts right. out as a liquid that fossilizes. So it's kind of like you've seen paperweights with insects and leaves and things mm -hmm. in epoxy resin. Right. Very similar process right. with amber. The liquid flows over, traps the animal or the leaf, and then it hardens, and then it fossilizes, and then somebody digs it up but, years later. And, but, but the time scale even of the air that may be inside those bubbles... Right. Is nowhere close to the time frame that we're talking oh, about. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Presents, Jurassic right? Park talked about, oh, 60 million years ago. We're talking 850 million yeah. millions of years ago. Yeah. Wow. Uh, it's it's uh, 10 times what they were positing in Jurassic Park, more than 10 times. So it's crazy. The other thing from the news, sad news, the InSight lander is dying. On Mars, they're heading into winter. Winter is when the atmosphere cools, uh, CO2 solidifies and snows out onto the ground. Literally a third of the atmosphere falls out onto the ground, <laughs> which is just, to me, it just blows yeah. my mind. Yeah. But the other thing is that as the atmosphere cools, a lot more dust is deposited and mm -hmm. the local temperatures drop. When the temperatures drop, the strain on electronics to keep warm uh, demands more battery power and the dust settling out on the solar panels means that, ooh, this is a problem. We used to get about 10 kilowatts per day out of the InSight lander solar panels. Today we're getting less than one. How long has the InSight been on the planet? Is it uh, 11 years? Yeah, ten or, about 10 ten, years, ten about Earth a decade. Years, 10 Earth years? Yeah. And, and it had a... It had, a, uh, it had one Martian year lifetime yeah. expectancy, yeah, two so, years, and so it's exceeded that by several times, yeah. and it's done amazing stuff. And just recently, it detected magnitude 4 and a magnitude 5 right. quake. And it's funny, someone said, oh, this is, this is the biggest quake we think we can have on Mars. Um, no. <laughs> nature, nature always exceeds your expectations. 
they built the Fukushima nuclear plant, and brilliant people, brilliant engineers built it. This will withstand an 8 to 8.3 earthquake. And, of course, what Nature happened? Nature laughs. Nature laughs, rolls over, 9 point something earthquake. Oh, well, let's build it right next to the sea, too. Yeah. So now a big well, tsunami comes in on well, top of the earthquake. That yeah. wasn't dumb either. I mean, they need cooling water. But, uh, sure, but we're not going to debate tracking. their engineering here. But when somebody says, this is the biggest quake we can have on Mars, I just kind of smile and go, yeah. You know, That's when nature says, hold my beer. Yeah. So previously, <laughs> I mean, in previous winters, Martian winters, yes. NASA has tried to park it on slopes. Oh, no, this is, this is a mean, stationary. Oh, this is the stationary, stationary yes, lander. I was yeah. thinking the rovers. Where yeah. they where they park them on south facing slopes on south facing slopes yeah. to get more sun on those and so. insight did get a kind of a life extension cuz a dust devil went over it and blew the dust off why, the collectors why do you think they don't put windshield wipers on them or or come with a way to go and then go back i mean just that's what the wait. new camera sensors do is they're able to vibrate uh, that takes energy and i thought you know i wondered if there was a way to very slowly compress gas so you could have a nozzle like one of those rainbird sprinklers went right. psh. You know, you'd think that they would come up with a way. The technical challenges of doing that have to be immense. They Otherwise, are. And they every kilogram, do it. every kilogram costs, costs a million dollars or 10,000. Well, or and it whatever. means it's a kilogram of instrumentation you don't get to take with Correct. you. Correct. Right. Yeah, so, so it's trade off. So they make, it is a they consciously acknowledge we're not going to do that so we can have more science. Yeah. So, Insight is in a uh, safe mode. The computers are all down to their minimum level, and they're not expecting it to survive the winter. They're expected. It's on a schedule where every few days, week, it goes, beep, I'm here, and they're expecting that even that to it, fail sometimes this winter. It's down to the point that it's, it might as well have failed because they're doing no science. They're doing no science. Because it goes... Beep, I'm here once a week or well, whatever. But if you got a lucky dust devil, it might recharge in yeah. the spring, but yeah. we don't think that's gonna happen. No. Anyway, so, so you know to all the Insight Lander team at NASA, kudos to you. Your instrument has functioned brilliantly for many years, longer than expected, and it's done great science. And so hats off to you at the end of this long, long mission. So next week next week. Next week, here's a question from the audience. Sure. Me. Um, they're getting some strange telemetry from Voyager 1 or 2. Yes. Let's talk about that next week. Okay. And talk about the time scale involved and, and okay. the astounding engineering. I think a focus on Voyager 1 and 2 would be... We could have a show on Voyager 1 and 2. If you can do that. So maybe not next week, but in coming we weeks. Can, we can do that I in think the coming weeks. That'll be fun to talk about as well. It would be. And... Whenever you get something like this, Kent, and you know this as well as I do, when somebody at NASA says, gee, we're getting a strange signal from our probe, immediately the fringe media. We'll just be we'll just say the fringe media. Oh clearly, media. clearly there's aliens playing games with it. They all they all wind it up. And the other thing we're gonna talk about next week, we're gonna talk about the the door on Mars. Uh, well, which, which could be a portal for the Kuiper Beltians. And, Kent, you've been watching the show long enough. You know that I do not always follow the company line on interpreting what NASA says about data from rovers and landers. And there are things I hold as a belief, but not scientifically proven. And you know that I'm an independent thinker. But on this one, i got to say, the people who are saying, it's a doorway for beings uh sorry y'all but we'll talk about it we'll talk yeah. about it yeah. and as always i'm not going to presume to tell you what to think that that would be bad science teacher bad go sit in the corner i'm going to give you the data i'll tell you what i think and i'll tell you why i think so but you're going to have to make up your own mind everybody's everybody's got to have an independent idea and an independent thought I've described science as being sort of like a steamroller going over, and lots of people can pop up and say, but I think, but I think, but I think, eventually the steamroller of science will flatten out the playing field and show us what the, show us what's really happening, 
reveal the truth from us. It's never complete truth. It's never perfect truth. It's never the ultimate truth. But when we talk about, gee, take a debate that raged for two millennia. Is the Earth in the center of the solar system or the sun? Well, clearly it is. At some point, we didn't, for a long time, we didn't have the technology. There was right. no telescope. Galileo perfected the astronomical telescope, and he collected data and the evidence, and didn't end the debate overnight. No. No. It well. took another 100, 100 years or so, but eventually so much data came in supporting one interpretation that everybody switched over. Except the flat earthians. <laughs> We're not. We're not gonna. This, this. Our audience, Kent, is high flyers and clever thinkers, and I don't think we have. I don't think we have flat Earthians. If we do, uh, what did you say? I can't see when there's up. The camera's in the way. Um, people avoid Harold Locke. Notice that people avoid making uh, sort of claims on the JWST. Right. People. Yeah. Yeah. They. Yeah. And again, we we try to we try to deal with science as uh, science supported by data, and certainly, especially when you talk about the bleeding edge of science, there are a variety of interpretations, and these are all from people who are well-meaning, well-informed, and nobody's doing this to be tricky or to perpetrate anything. It's just it's possible for uh, hardworking, honest, intelligent people to disagree. We try to go with presenting facts on this program, and we I'm not shy about telling you what I think, but I'm also clear about separating out from my opinion from data and facts, and uh, we try not to take a look at, try to be too fringy. But let's talk about black holes, and we're going to back up for people who may be new. And what is a black hole? And so uh, if we can show our image number one, we take a look at this. And uh, I think one of the most brilliant encapsulations of relativity theory comes from uh, John Archibald Wheeler, who was a student of Einstein. And he said, matter tells space-time how to curve. And the curvature of space-time tells matter how to move. We take a look at our little picture we have there, and we see a star and a planet. And we see the star makes a big dent in the space-time continuum there, and the planet makes a smaller dent. And uh, in any case, the grid we have there is a two-dimensional representation. Space-time is 4D. I'm not going to get into the math. But essentially, we call it a gravity well because it is the space-time curves in towards the center of mass from all directions, and that's why planets orbit around stars, and that's why things fall to the nearest high-gravity, high-mass object. If you, small-mass object, are standing on a planet like the Earth, you trip, you fall down, you go boom, because gravity, and it works that way, not because the Earth reaches out at a distance and touches you, but because the Earth warps space-time in our neighborhood and causes you to fall into the center. The more mass you have, the more curvature you get. <clears throat> and the more curvature you get, the faster you have to go to escape that gravity well. If you take a look at that image we have there, and you think about, oh, if I had a marble, and I was at the bottom of that depression, and I'm flicking that marble, to get it to go all the way up and out of the well takes a certain amount of speed, a certain amount of energy. The deeper we make the well, the more profound the curvature, the more energy it takes, the faster you have to go to escape. When you hit a degree of curvature where the escape speed is as great as the speed of light or greater, you have a black hole. Now you have a gravity well where nothing is fast enough to escape. And that's what we call a black hole. That distance from the center where the escape velocity exceeds the speed of light, that's the event horizon, the Schwarzschild radius, and that's the boundary of no return. So 
That's the classical stuff. I'm not going to go do a whole show on black holes here, but that's what a black hole is. And, of course, people say, but if nothing comes out, how can you take a picture of it? Well, if you take a good look and listen carefully to what the scientists are saying who were imaging these things, they didn't take a picture of the black hole itself. They took a picture of the gas swirling around as it falls in. Of everything around it. Past that's right. So if you were to take, if you had an invisible man who cast a shadow, and you can say, oh, I can see where you are because you cast a shadow. Claude Rains, Invisible Man movie, how did they track him? Walking across uh, the ground, they would see the footprints. You've all seen these Invisible Man type things. Uh, Forbidden Planet, right? The invisible monster with the footsteps. So we can see where it is by the effect it has on things around. That's how we track black holes. The first black hole, Cygnus X1, was detected because the gas as it spirals in, just like the gas and dust around a protostar, it flattens into a disk. This causes a lot of compression, a lot of friction, because... Each particle closer is moving at a slightly different speed. They rub against each other, and this compression and this friction both generate heat, and these materials get hot enough that they give off radiation, electromagnetic radiation, in the entire EM spectrum. So you get to see everything from radio waves to X-rays and beyond, and that's essentially what happens with a black hole. The material in falling produces all kinds of radiation. However, all kinds of radiation, all parts of the spectrum are not equal. It turns out the shorter stuff, which is easier to image, like x-rays, ultraviolet, even visible light, yeah, it's a very short wavelength, so it gives us a very nice detailed picture. But it doesn't penetrate dust very well. It gets absorbed. It's highly absorbed by dust. And so when we look at this... No, I'm, I'm camera two. That's yeah. okay. When we look at this... Over there. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Don't worry about it. I have a magnificent profile. I'll have you. Yeah, how you do. So we, we look at this uh, light that's coming through. It turns out that the light that we commonly think of as... Uh, light for a telescope, things like uh, ultraviolet, X-ray, visible light. If we're talking about imaging a large black hole at the center of a galaxy, that light doesn't escape, not because of the black hole, but because galaxies are filled with dust and particulates and gas, and all of these absorb the light. So we can't see directly. So what kind of radiation does get out? The really long wavelengths escape those dusty cocoons, and that's radio. So we say, hmm, all right, so if we can see with a radio telescope, and we can see, wow, here we go, we've got a radio telescope, can we image a black hole at the center of a galaxy? Problem is, these black holes are very, very far away. We also have an additional problem, the supermassive black hole, or SMBH, at the center of our galaxy, which we call Sagittarius A star, that object is relatively small. As supermassive black holes go, it's a punk. It's just a little guy. And so being small, the gas around it swirls very quickly. The clouds orbit very rapidly. It's very changeable. It's very changeable. And because it's so changeable, imaging it is harder because it's always changing. We're talking about, let's take a picture of someone on a carousel at the State Fair. Well, that carousel is moving, and so the view is changing all the time, and that makes it interesting because capturing a sharp image is harder. So they didn't start with imaging the black hole at the center of our galaxy, they looked at the center of the galaxy known as M87. And if we could see the next image, please. We'll take a look. Those of you who uh, may have downloaded 
the program guide. These images are in there for you. Uh, these next couple of images I did myself. So, as usual, uh, the high or low quality nature of the images, that's all my fault. So, how does this interferometry work? Because we use interferometry to see into the center of a galaxy. So let's take an example. Let's take a 300 millimeter telescope mirror, your proverbial 12 inch Dobsonian, okay? Something many of us are familiar with, probably many of us own a like instrument. Well, if we take a 300 millimeter mirror and we go ahead and we do the pi r squared equation and we say, gee, how much light gathering area do we have? And you say, oh, 300 millimeters, that's pi r squared, that's pi times 150 millimeters squared, and immediately somebody will go, uh-uh-uh, there's a central obstruction in a Dobsonian, because you have the primary mirror, and then up here somewhere you have the secondary mirror that bends the light cone and sends it out to the focuser to your eye. So we take a look at the middle of this image, and we see, oh, some of the mirror is already shadowed out. New observers, people who are buying their first telescope, you we often do not, and the customer service line, but wait, there's this, there's this other thing in the middle, and how can I see around that? Oh, they'll say in the daytime, they'll go, I've got this big black hole, big That's black circle in the middle, and I go through the process of explaining that during the day, your pupil is, is not dilated, Right. And so you can see it because your pupil is smaller than it is, but when you look through it, the At angular night. diameter is such that your pupil is bigger around than it is from an angular measurement. Right. And you see right past it. You see right visible. past it. You don't see it. Right. And but, so, but you can see it at night if you have a lot of lights around you. Or if you're looking at the moon. Or look at the moon, you can still see it yes, there. Yes, you right. can. There are times you can see it. So you're looking at this central obstruction and you realize, oh, if I want to know the light gathering area of this mirror, I've got to take the whole 300 millimeter mirror and then I have to separate out or subtract away the area obstructed by that secondary mirror. A couple of square inches maybe. A couple of square inches. And you go, okay, well, what if you have your nice new 12 inch Dobsonian and your four year old gets you up one morning and said, oh, look what I did. I like your Dobsonian, your telescope, and I was looking at a picture book with cows, and so I took a marker and colored a picture of a cow on your mirror. Aren't you proud of me? Isn't it pretty? And um, you might think, I'm going to have to shop for a new telescope, or maybe shop for a new four-year-old, as the case may be, yeah. whichever's on sale. <laughs> yeah, so Paul, could you move it, oh, that graphic over a little bit, because... Yeah, we can't see the whole... We're seeing the, the, the cow, Holstein cow mirror is cut off in half. Or I don't know, maybe it's visible for our audience and it's just the, the chat is covering oh, it. Oh, uh, that's what it is. Okay, Please there you go. Read the, read the comments. Oh. It's co the comments are covering it up. That's what it's doing. Okay. Okay, there gotcha. we go. Yep. So we've got, our, we've got our cow mirror here with many obstructions. The fact of the mirror matter is, your mirror still works perfectly fine. You can point it to the moon or Jupiter or a galaxy and you can get a perfectly good image. Matter of fact, the accuracy of your image, the amount of fine detail in your image will not have changed really at all. What's changed is the brightness. You're still getting light from across the entire surface. It's just that certain portions have been blacked out. There's a very famous story, uh, a big, I believe it's McDonald Observatory yes. in Texas. 1972, I think the it was. Guy, crazy guy went in waving a pistol and, you're looking at God, it's not allowed. And he shot five or six bullets into the main mirror of this great big telescope. And everybody's like, oh. And the astronomer said, no, it'll be fine. They just poured pitch in the holes and covered it over with black paint. And it's fine. They lost less than 1% of the light gathering. The rest of the telescope, the figure of the mirror wasn't changed at all. And, and so just because there's six black holes, so we're talking about black holes, see what I did there? Just because there's six black holes on the yes, surface indeed. of that mirror, 
effectively no effect. No effect, so no change. Minor, minor. No change. And, and from a telescope standpoint, I know people with, with Newtonian and Dobsonian telescopes, and they see a wee bit of dust and start having conniption fits. They and do. Take the, and they, they try and clean it, and they rub on it. And they ruin the mirror. And they ruin the mirror. Don't do that. Dust. David Levy, uh, famed comet hunter, has never cleaned his mirrors. Yeah. He doesn't clean his objectives. He says there's no need. No. And you look at him, and, and, and I know people who their OCD would cause them to have a conniption fit. They would. You know, and it just and he lives in the Arizona desert, has a roll-off roof observatory. Lots where, of dust. Lots of dust, and it, it doesn't matter, no. you know, and leave them alone. Uh, yeah. Because of this reason right here, because of the cow mirror. Right. right. Because of the cow mirror. And so let's go ahead and take a look at our next image there. We should call that a Holstein mirror. Because <laughs> it has holes in it? No, it's, well, that, and it looks like a Holstein cow. Yeah? I like that. You I know, like at, that. At star parties, I've stood in front of a big Dobsonian yeah. and covered over half of it with my head, and nobody knew. The, the person nobody looking knew. could not tell. Could not tell. Could not tell that somebody was, yes. something was blocking over there half the mirror. Paul, you get there. There we, we go. go. So... This represents uh, the biggest synthetic aperture or interferometry telescope in the world. Basically, and I've got, I think, what have I got there? Uh, eight, eight sites. I think they only have six or seven. And these radio telescopes are all, all roughly in the, they're in the 10 to 30 meter class. I think most of them are in the 30 meter class. So you've got six to eight 30 meter dishes around the world and keep in mind we can't evenly space them out you can't put them out in the ocean you can't put them in the middle of a city uh, you want them somewhere that's relatively radio quiet so we can only site put these things where the conditions are good for them but these seven or eight sites work together and they essentially form pieces of one reflector. Now, what's interesting, you talk about that Holstein mirror image. Why does it work so well? It works so well because by coloring over or painting over parts of the mirror, we don't change the figure, the curved figure of the mirror that focuses light. It's still all in one piece. It's still one nice uh, uniform curvature. And so it's still, no matter what part of the mirror light does reflect from, it all focuses properly like it did before there was any color or paint on the mirror at all. What we have with this image right here, it's, we have a situation where we've got, excuse me, six or eight uh, radio telescopes, and provided we can point them accurately enough and sync up the time signals. Obviously, pointing them accurately is kind of self-explanatory because if they're all going, if you're going to be combining the images, you have to make sure that the images are, the telescope is pointing the same way, that there's no skew, nothing else, that the images are focused on center. That's really important. Any of you who have done mosaic, taken, say, photos of the moon and done a mosaic and put them together, you know what a challenge that is to make sure everything's the same size and the same scale and the same brightness. Much the same here. But the time requirement sometimes baffles people. Why do they have to align these with a time signal precision of a trillionth of a second? Why do they have to do that? It's because we're looking at a light wave signal. And we're looking at the time that a wave signal arrives, we want to stop and start the data collection at the same point of the wave train as it comes into the telescope and that data is recorded by computers. So it turns so, out... So, go ahead. Let me ask, so if your waves are out of phase, then they're going to create peaks and valleys. They, just like, there's also areas where they cancel and where right, it's too bright it's and too, it's too dark. Right, so... If two waves hit exactly at the right spot, they create, like out in the ocean, a rogue wave. Right, it's called that's, reinforcement. That's twice the 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 um, size of the wave. Correct. And if two of those, they'll double up, and you know you can get and these freak waves. And if you have a peak waves, and a trough come together, they, they zero out. They to zero nowhere. out. 
Right. So same thing here. They've got to get those waves. From They've got to get it exactly all in sync. Exactly in sync. So now their signal to noise ratio is exactly the same. And the reason and their signal right. is in phase. And the reason you're talking a trillionth of a second, light goes really fast. And we're talking all kinds of electromagnetic. Really fast. Very fast. 186,000 miles a second. Yeah. Uh, what is it? Three. I don't remember in kilometers. Three million kilometers a second, something man. like that. So, uh, it's an outrageously high speed. And so when you're talking even long waves, like radio waves, one to three meters, uh, you're talking about you've got to get the time signal right on the money. Which involves, you know, if you're here and the ones that are close are going to get there quicker than the ones that are farther away, there's all sorts right. of delay systems they right. have to build in right. to get account for the distance, basically. Yeah. And uh, overwhelming, overwhelming ideas in overwhelming. my mind. You know, and how to, how to okay, how are we going to slow it down or add wire to make it the same distance? I mean, it's amazing. The interesting thing too, if you think about that previous image, with these six or eight thirty-meter discs representing a twelve-thousand-kilometer disc, right? right? The aperture is effectively the diameter of the Earth. Synthetic aperture. And if we could put one on the moon, we would then have, oh, a 385,000 kilometer aperture yeah. because you'd get the distance between the Earth and moon. But we've just got Earth-bound radio telescopes right now. And so, gee, we're going ahead and talking six or eight 30 meter disks compared to a 12,000 kilometer disk. We don't have very much of that effective aperture is receiving light. Right. It's, it's just a very small area. So our image is really, really dim. And this is the same problem that astrophotographers had in days gone by before frame stacking. They had to go ahead and point a telescope for a long time to collect enough photons to get an image. Mm -hmm. And they're having the same problem now they're radio photons instead of visible photons, but you're still talking about collecting photons. And so it takes a very long time signal, a very long extended data collection period. And we're not talking over one night, we're talking over many, 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 many uh, days and hours and hours and hours of data, and they put it together. So the question then runs, gee, how are we sure that it's the right image? How do we know it's correct? And the answer to that is they went ahead and took the data set, and they took many teams of scientists, and they said, you can't talk to anybody else. Mm -hmm. And so here's the data set, and you work together and figure out how to do the math and how to reduce this. And then when you've got what you think is an image, you submit it to the judging team, and they said, nope, you're disagreeing with other people. And when they finally got to where they were getting uh, coherent data from independent, multiple independent teams, then they finally put it together. You're talking about years of work on a data set that took uh, thousands of hours to collect. And then you're talking about, oh my gosh, probably a million man hours or more uh, of very clever people working with the math and doing the data analysis till they all got it. And you can go ahead and throw up the next couple of images there and you can see what we imaged. The first one we imaged was about uh, a year ago and this was the image of the supermassive black hole in M87. And there it is. And this made news around the world. First picture of a black hole. And I'm sure there's a Nobel Prize in there. Yeah. They haven't said so yet. But the Nobel Committee, <laughs> they're not the fastest responding group in the world. But there's a Nobel Prize in there. That's my, that's my futurism prediction for the day. What we've done this week is we've been able to image the black hole to the center of our own galaxy. And people say, well, gee, wouldn't that have been easier our supermassive black hole is maybe 30,000 light years away, and M87 is millions of years away. The problem is it's not easier at all. When we're talking about our galaxy, we live 
in the big fat bulge where all the dust is because that's where the star systems are formed. <clears throat> and M87 is more face on to us so we can see into the center without looking through all that dust along the edge of the plane of the galaxy. And the other thing, as I've told you, our black hole, uh, M87 is about 1,500 times larger. And because it's that much larger, it changes much more slowly. Uh, the swirling clouds of gas going around Sagittarius A star change over the scale of hours where the ones around M87 change over a scale of months. And so it was much more difficult, much more challenging actually, to image the black hole at the center of our own galaxy. I suppose the next great challenge, see if you could make an image of a uh, smaller black hole that's closer to home. That would be an interesting challenge as well. We'll have to see what the future brings. I've got about five minutes for questioning today. I'm going to have to leave a little bit early because I do have another program. I'm going to an elementary school and doing a, uh, a planetarium program for them. My university has an inflatable planetarium that we take around to dozens of schools every year. And uh, the kids and parents of John Tyson Elementary here in Springdale are getting a planetarium show tonight. So let's see. Do we have any interesting questions that I have come up? I haven't seen any come up. If you all have some questions, go ahead and uh, ask them. We'll try and keep track of them. Harold Locke posits, thus, if the salt crystals are dated right, it seems that life has always been around. Maybe that everything is living and organic. Heck, <laughs> if I know how to think about it. Well, I think I'll take a step first. I think that's a pretty good way to look at it. I think, you know, statistically, we're not alone. You know, but statistics will also tell you that we're alone. I mean, it's possible. Just like you can't flip a penny and come up with a hundred, with a heads a hundred times, hundred times in a row. In a row. No. But you can. I mean, it's, yeah. it is possible. Aristotle calls it an improbable possible. Exactly. It's highly, you know, so there's two billion stars in the Milky Way. If 10% of them have habitable planets, then, and then only 10% of those are in the, you're still talking about like 20,000 planets. Yeah, you're still talking about many, 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 many civilizations. And that's just in the Milky Way. You multiply that, how many galaxies? Right. That are out there and, and it becomes a... You have to balance that against the, uh, the incredible distances. If you were going to fly, there's only about 50 stars within 100 light years. So... Statistically, that may, may not be home unless intelligent life is incredibly common. That's not likely to be the home of the next nearest civilization. If the next nearest civilization was 100 light years away, uh, you're talking about any kind of reasonable technology. Even if you're talking light let's, speed technology, you're talking a 100-year trip. Let's, let's talk about, so maybe a little bit closer. Let's talk about uh, to Sagittarius A. Uh, 4.2 light years away. Oh, you're talking Proxima. Proxima, Cent Proxima Centauri A. Right. So let's say we could accelerate to 90% the speed of light. You're still talking a 20-year trip each way. Yeah. So Because you have to but, accelerate for half the trip and then decelerate for the other half. It's more energy, it takes more energy than what's on Earth to, to potentially oh. accelerate a mass that that. Not far. only that, think about... But, we've all gone on camping trips, right? We're going for a weekend to go camp down by the river and fish and swim. Fine. Think about how much junk you pack in the family van. Van and, Vanster. Right. Yeah. And then think about, oh, okay, we're going on a minimum 40-year round trip. To find out if anything there. To find well, out. We're going to spend five years there looking, so now we're 50 years out. Right, right, 50 years out. How much stuff? You're going to have to have a ship that's big enough to hold 50 years. You're talking about ships that are the size of a large asteroid or a small moon. We can detect things in orbit that are the size of my thumb. We routinely detect asteroids that are tens of meters wide. If something like this, you know that famous line from Star Wars, that's not a moon, it's a spaceship? Well, <laughs> something yeah. like that, 
Uh, the Umama, and I'm probably saying that badly, yes. the interstellar object that passed through our, our solar system, that was a few kilometers long. And, and we detected it. We detected it. But run into it. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, there's so much of nothing out there. Right. That's not probable. But here's the problem. You're, you're gone for 50 years. You accelerate to yeah. at 90% the speed of light. You're gone for 50 years from your perspective. <clears throat> But because of relative and time dilation, when you get back in 50 years, everybody else, everybody else on Earth has been dead for hundreds yes. of years. And, 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 and not only that, but during the slowing down phase, your propulsive engine has to be pointing right at Earth. Yes. Yeah. So you've got this big moon-sized thing Getting with a rocket engine closer. pointing right at you and for no years. Yeah, for years. for years as it's coming. Decades. And people have, for, it's been so many generations, people have forgot you're out there and yeah. don't know you're coming back. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's kind of a, it's kind of a <laughs> famous uh, trope from science fiction. But uh, there yes. we go. Have you seen the latest picture of uh, Sagittarius? The stars flipped. That's Martin Eastburn's asking. I don't know. I'm not sure if you're talking about Sagittarius A star. There were no individual stars in that photo. Uh, it was just the radio image of the swirling gas disk that surrounds that black hole. More uh, information there, Martin. I don't think we have enough information. Yeah, to be able to... I'm missing. I, th I feel like I'm missing part of your question. So, you but know. I'm going to have to wrap it up in any case anyway because I need to head out to okay. my next event yes, next and uh, friends if you uh, question can neutrinos be collected as an energy source no uh, because they're so hard to catch they typically fly through the entire uh, earth without stopping and the supernova from 1987 we caught 11 neutrinos we didn't catch them we 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 can't, we we caught evidence of their presence. Right. They I mean, they struck atoms and their energy was converted to light. So no, neutrinos would not be uh, a good energy source because they tend to shine right through things rather than interact with them. Right. So all anyway, right. there we go. There we go. So Kent, um, it's been a pleasure having you on my me. program. Nice. I'm glad, glad to be here. I think we may actually follow this format. You know, for the summer anyway. Sure. Potentially, Scott may be in here and you're in here. Sure. But this is going to be probably a, um, a regular occurrence while you're on summer vacation. And yes. With nothing else to do with his time, <laughs> uh, I say, he said facetiously. No, so, I'm working on uh, I'm working on two new books right now. Oh, can you share the? You, you gotta go. We can talk. Yeah. All right, I'll talk. So, we'll talk about that next. Doctor D will be back next week, and one of these future episodes. We're going to answer the crowd's question, please. That yeah, know, I'd love to do. Yeah. I'd love to do a crowdsource question show. Maybe that would be fun to do for episode fifty coming up. That would give you all time to uh, yeah. post so your questions. Post your questions to Explore Alliance. Scott, can you put this? Or Scott, Paul, put this in the chat, please. Explore Alliance at explorescientific.com. That's Explore Alliance at Explore scientific.com not explorer which is a fairly common mistake people or make. you can just send them to astronomy for educators at gmail.com astronomy for educators put 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 dr d's up there explore scientific.com and the other one is astronomy ast for educators at gmail at gmail.com there you go there you go so, friends, it's been nice, and I got to go, but we'll see you all next Monday. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye now. So, I'll stay. You take off. Okay. I'll stay here while Paul gets that going. All right. And you can go ahead and just turn Sounds your mic good. off and get out of here. So, Paul, once you get those up. Uh, Tuesday, we're going to have a Global Star Party uh, episode uh, on Amazon Live, then followed by... Um, uh, my first, like, our Global Star Party uh, on, Am on Amazon Live, followed by Scott's Global Star Party. He should be back from his trip to Flagstaff, Arizona. He was in Denver a little while ago. 
And then Wednesday, we'll have First Light Chronicles. Thursday, we'll be on the wing, and I am taking off Friday afternoon. So uh, we will probably have uh, Tyler sit in for the Amazon Live uh, episode of uh, as, um, 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 Focus on Astrophotography, and then he'll do his as well. So anyway, we appreciate your time. I think Paul's got all that stuff up there. He also included a link for some further reading on all these subjects, uh, some pretty interesting stuff. I'm fascinated by the possibility of 850-year-old, 850-million-year-old life that can be reanimated. It's basically simply been in hibernation. Scary and fascinating at the same time. So anyway, on behalf of Dr. Barth, who had to take off, I'm Kent Martz. Thank you, Paul Newton, over in the control room for uh, keeping the show up and running and passing along the comments and making this all work. We appreciate it very much. So uh, on behalf of everybody else here at Explore Scientific, see you tomorrow when we do Global Star Party. Thank you and good evening, everyone.